Okay, in, in previous lectures we've talked about uh, crystallographic points, we've talked about crystallographic directions, and now we want to talk about crystallographic planes. And we're going to describe those by quantities that we're, we'll call Miller indices, okay? So let's begin. Um, crystallographic planes are going to be identified by Miller indices H, K, and L. So let me give you an algorithm uh, for computing these, and let's just look at this particular plane in the unit cell. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me also make reference to how you're used to, uh, from your engineering classes, maybe uh, describing planes. So normally, you're used to describing planes probably by um, a unit normal vector that's that's uh, perpendicular to the plane. And um, so, so you're probably unfamiliar with describing them in any other way. I'll just tell you up front that uh, the HKL indices when we're working with a cubic system uh, are going to be, uh, are, if you were to plot the, an HKL vector, right, uh, it would be orthogonal to the plane. Okay, so I will just tell you that there is a linkage between how you've described them in the past and, and how we're going to develop um, to describe them here. The reason that we do this is because uh, in, in crystal systems, not all um, uh, not all of the crystal systems are cubic. And so we want to develop a very general technique for describing uh, 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 these planes within the crystal structure. And we're going to use these Miller indices uh, shortly in probably the next lecture um, to, to talk about um, x-ray diffraction and how we might um, assess the kinds of crystal structures that are present in a material, okay? So that's where we're going with this. So let me just jump right in and, and talk about how do we compute a Miller index or the, the Miller indices for this plane. So this blue plane that I'm showing you, uh, it resides in some crystal structure. And, and in this case, <clears throat> the, uh, the crystal axes are orthogonal uh, and they have length A, B, and C in the X, Y, and Z directions respectively. So step one uh, is first you want to examine if the plane intersects the origin. And if it does, you need to choose a new origin uh, in some adjacent cell. So we look at this and we see that this blue plane, it runs from this diagonal to, uh, point to here. It does not intersect the origin, so we're okay. We don't have to do anything. The step two is to determine the, the values QRS um, where the plane intercepts the X, Y, and Z axis. And QRS is going to be in terms of the unit cell length. So we want to locate the intercepts. That's the goal. So here we go. There's our intercepts. Let's have a look at the x-axis. Well, this plane that we're looking at here, this blue plane, it intersects the x-axis at the value uh, a. So 1 times a, right? So that means that the q we would be looking for here uh, is going to be 1. So q equals 1. OK, how about the y? Well, it intersects the y-axis at b, or so we'll just call it 1b, and so that uh, r value will just be 1, okay? And finally, how about the c-axis? Well, this plane runs up forever, and it will it, it never inter intersects the, the z-axis, right? So we would say that the intercept is at infinity, and so we would write that the s value is infinity, okay? Okay, so now what do we do next? We're going to take the reciprocals, uh, UVW, of the values QRS. So U is going to be equal to 1 over Q. V is going to be equal to 1 over R. W is going to be equal to 1 over S. And we just computed these QRS values, okay? So in this case, we have uh, 1 over 1, which is 1. 1 over 1, which is 1. 1 over infinity, which is 0. So our UVW values are 1, 1, 0, okay? <clears throat> the next rule says if u, v, and w are not integers, then we're going to multiply them by some common factor to get the smallest in uh, integer values hkl that we can. And those values hkl are going to be the Miller indices. But we look at u, v, and w, we see that they're in fact all integers, so we don't need to multiply by anything. And we have an hkl values of 1, 1, and 0. Okay, we enclose... Um, the Miller indices in parentheses, these HKL values, HKL values, and we we don't have any commas between them, so we just write parentheses HKL, 
So this plane is described as the 110 plane. Okay. I'm going to do some more examples. So if you're like, wow, this seems confusing, I'm going to do uh, probably three more examples. And, and then uh, hopefully you'll, you'll have a, a good handle on how to do this. But I just want to point out something that go, uh, uh, points back to what I said at the beginning about how we've defined planes originally. If you look at the 110 direction, that's go, that would run from this origin to this point here. And you would see that that would be a vector that would be perpendicular to this plane. Okay? So... So there is a relationship between what you've learned before and what we're doing now. And in point of fact, we're only going to work with cubic um, systems in this class. So that's always a good check in the back of your mind if you want to see, did I do, did I do the planes right um, when we're working in this cubic systems is go back and just plot the vector, in this case, 110. It's going to run from here to here and just make sure that it's orthogonal to the plane. And, or, or, and if it's not, then you know you, you have a problem. Okay. Um, so... We'll move on to just to do another example. We're going to do uh, three more examples, and then and then uh, uh, I'll give you some some definitions. Um, so th here's another example. This is a, a simple plane. Looks like. Um, let's just apply blindly our our method. Okay. So first, we need to determine does the plane intersect the origin. Uh, it it does not. So we don't need to worry about that rule. We don't need to choose a new origin. Then we want to determine the values Q, R, and S where the plane intercepts the X, Y, and Z axes. So here we go. There's our intercepts. Looks like the plane intersects the X axis at 1 half times A. So our Q value will be 1 half. It looks like the plane never will intersect the Y axis. So that's going to be uh, an R value of infinity. And it'll also never... Um, uh, uh, intersect the z-axis, so we'd have another value s equals infinity, right? Now we're going to take the reciprocals uh, u, v, and w of the values q, r, and s. So, right, so we'll, we'll take 1 over 1 half to get that u equals 2. 1 over infinity is 0, so that's what we have for v and w. So we have u is equal to 2, v is equal to 0, w is equal to 0. Okay, the next rule says if u, v, and w are not integers, then we m multiply by a common factor. Well, u, v, and w are integers. 2, 0, 0 is an integer. So we don't do anything. We just leave it. And that gives us an HKL index of 2, 0, 0. Okay? So um, we're going to go ahead and enclose these Miller indices in parentheses with no commas and write that this red plane that we're looking at is, in fact, the 2, 0, 0 plane. Okay? So... Uh, Let's, let's move on and, and try something that we're going to have to uh, explore uh, moving the origin on, okay? So here's another plane. Um, you can see it runs uh, from, from the, this uh, diagonal on the top down to the origin, so it does intersect the origin. And so we have to apply this first rule. Uh, we need to choose a new origin. So where do we choose an origin? Well, we want to choose one that will let us compute where the plane is going to intersect these axes. So in this case, we'll just shift the origin up, right? Because this is a lattice structure, we can translate it to another, to the origin to another cell without any problem. So we shifted this up. Now this green star is our new origin. And so we basically have uh, the x-axis and the y-axis defined as follows. Okay, so now we can go ahead and determine the values q, r, and s where the plane intercepts the x, y, and z axes. Uh, here's our intercepts. Looks like it intersects the x-axis uh, at a value of 1a. So q will equal 1. It intersects the value of the y-axis at 1b. So r will equal 1. And it intersects the z-axis at negative 1c. So s will be negative 1. We can take the reciprocals. Uh, the reciprocals here are all just 1. So uh, the U, V, and W values are the same as the Q, R, S values. Um, they are, in fact, all integers, so we don't need to multiply by anything. And so our H, K, L values are going to be 1, 1, and 0. So we then go ahead and enclose these values in parentheses with no commas. But just like we did with the directions, if we have a negative Miller index, we're going to use an overbar to denote that it's negative instead of writing the negative. So the plane that we're looking at here is the 1, 1, 1 bar plane. Okay? Hopefully that was straightforward. Let's do one more 
uh, so we can have applied at least applied all the rules at least once. Okay. Let's look at this plane here, um, and and uh, because this is going to now ha have us uh, work with multiplying uh, to get a, a uh, an integer value. So we do our check. Does it does the plane intersect the origin? Well, no, it doesn't. So we're good to go. We can we can move on. Next, we're going to determine the values QRS where the plane the plane intercepts the x, y, and z axes. So let's do our intercept calculations. The plane intersects the x axis at one half a. So R is going to, or sorry, Q is going to be equal to one half. It intersects the Y axis at one B. So R is going to be equal one. And it intersects the Z axis at three fourths C. So S will be three fourths. Okay. So we go ahead, take our reciprocals to, uh, to get U, V, and W. And we find that uh, one over one half is two. One over one is one. One over three fourths is four thirds. Okay. So we have U, V, and W being 2, 1, and 4 thirds, respectively. Now, uh, in this case, they're not all integers, right? 4 thirds, clearly not an integer. So we need to multiply by some, multiply all of them by a common factor to get the smallest integer values. In this case, the, the only way we can do that is to multiply everything by 3. So we do that. We multiply two, uh, U by 3, which gives us H equals 6. Multiply 1 by 3 gives us k equals 3, and multiply 4 thirds by 3 gives us l equals 4. And then we go ahead and enclose the Miller indices in parentheses to indicate that it's a plane with no commas. And this, uh, and so we would say this is the 634 plane. Okay? All right. So um, sometimes we want to denote a family of planes, uh, just like we did, we denoted a family of directions, right? Uh, they were crystallographically equivalent. In this case, the planes are going to have the same atomic arrangement within the plane. And we're going to denote these families uh, with braces, uh, HKL. So we denote a single plane with parentheses. We denote a family of planes with braces. Uh, before we, we talk about um, the families with, that we denote with braces, let's first talk about just some common planes. And we can, uh, we can give an equivalent just by translating them. So uh, what I'm showing you here is a 001 plane, and and so this would be the 001 plane with reference to this origin zero. These are equivalent planes, right? But they're still referred to as the 001. They actually aren't. They don't need a special family denotion. Uh, they're just uh, uh, they're planes that are obtained just via translation. Okay. Similarly, another common plane that we'll talk about is the 111 plane, and it just it uh, runs along the the diagonals the line the the intersection of the plane with the unit cell makes uh, diagonals along the unit cell faces there okay so this and then this is just again showing you that plane translated so it's still this is the one 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 plane with respect to the this origin zero uh, o these are also one 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 planes right so they again don't need the brace denotion they're uh, they're just uh, a, a, a translated 111 plane. And then similarly for 110 planes. Okay, so that's that's uh, uh, just how, how these planes look uh, when they're translated. But what about uh, an equivalent plane family? Um, let's just, this is an FCC crystal, the same we, we use for our example on directions. And let's say that this top plane here is the 001 plane. But if I were just to rotate this 90 degrees and so that this green plane was on uh, this, this side here, uh, it would be indistinguishable from it, right? It's identical. And so in point of fact, the 001 plane and the 010 plane are identical. The only reason we would denote one or the other is just how we've defined our coordinate system. There's nothing special about one over the other. And so as a result, we define a family of planes with these braces, the, the 100 family, which includes the 100 plane, the 010 plane, and the 001 plane, plus the negatives of those, okay? <clears throat> so that's how we denote fa uh, plane families. That's how we define plane families. Uh, just like uh, with crystal directions, where we had a linear density of atoms, with planes, we talk about a planar density of atoms. Um, and it's, it's very similar. In this case, the planar density is just the number of atoms centered on a plane divided by the area of the plane. So uh, as before, let's look at an example problem of this. 
So we're going to consider BCC, right? That's body center cubic iron with a unit cell length of uh, 0.287 millimeters. And we want to compute the planar density of the 100 plane. So the 100 plane, if you're looking at a cubic crystal, is just the, the top of that uh, cube. So it's this square if we're looking down on it, right? So we have a square with uh, um, a unit cell length of 0.287 nanometers. We know that within this square, there are four quarter atoms. Uh, so one at each cor uh, corner. So there's going to be a total of one atom centered on that plane within that area. So we can compute the planar density just as one atom per a, a squared and solve this out to find that the planar density in this case is 12.1 atoms per nanometer squared. Okay, so hopefully that's pretty straightforward. Um, uh, I guess the question I'll leave you with, um, and I kind of alluded to it earlier in the lecture, you know, we aren't, we are just barely now with our, with technology able to visualize Adam with some of our absolute best microscopes. I mean, I'm talking you know, just in the last couple years. Um, these knowledge, these materials and their structures have been around for a very long time. So I want to, I want you just to think about, cause this will be the topic we'll be beginning on next week. How did people figure out what, uh, the structure of these materials were before we could see the atoms? Um, and so, so I want you to think about that. Think about how we know so much about material structures in the absence of being able to, to see, um, to see inside of them really. Um, and, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more next week.